if you're watching and listening, um, thank you all for joining us. And if you're visiting us, we hope that you are blessed this morning. Okay, so this morning we're going to be finishing off Luke chapter 6. Now, in this final section of, of chapter 6, Jesus concludes his instructions to his disciples by giving them two more important lessons about ministry. Previously, if you remember, um, he's been teaching, he's been teaching an entire sermon. But two weeks ago when we were last together, he taught, he already had taught two important lessons, or he already uh, taught two already in the previous section. First of all, as his disciples, if we see ourselves as excellent guides, see ourselves as disciples, as people who can guide other younger Christians, but don't realize our own blindness, we're only going to lead people into a pit. In verse 40, he also reminded us that a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. In fact, the more we strive to be like him, the more we realized how far short we fall. This is a warning against pride, for nothing blinds a person like pride. And secondly, he used the image of an eye to teach us that it certainly isn't wrong to help a fellow believer see better by helping them remove the painful splinter that's in their eye. However, if we're going to do this effectively, if you're going to do this effectively, you must clearly see what's going on first, or clearly see what's going on by first removing the beam of wood from your own eye. The emphasis here was on being honest with ourselves and not becoming hypocrites. Well, here now, in these last two sections of chapter 6, the emphasis, well, he'll use two more illustrations to teach about, to continue to teach about character and obedience. Now, as you'll see as we, when we begin reading, the overall lesson he wants us to learn with these illustrations is our ministry. And not, it's not just serving here in the church, but just our ministry out there as believers, serving others, is to be a ministry of character. And thus, the title of my message, A Ministry of Character. See, what you are is far more important than anything you'll ever say or do because the final result of your service will be determined by your character and your obedience to God. So before we get into God's word, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you brought us all here together. It is amazing and beautiful to see all these beautiful, wonderful faces that you created, Lord, that you love and that you died for, Lord. I ask that you speak mildly at this time, fill this room with your Holy Spirit, soften hearts, soften minds, Lord. We want to know you more. We want to fall more in love with you. Lord, so show us, Lord. <coughs> Convict us where we need to be convicted and <coughs> Help us, Lord, <clears throat> become more intimate with you, Lord, to, to walk closer with you. We need, we need your help with that, Lord. Help us to focus now on you, on what you have to say, on your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and we're going to be picking up in verse 43. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. And the word of God says, or our Lord and Savior said this, A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce bad good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Aren't gathered from thorn bush bushes 
or grapes picked from a bramble bush. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. In this third illustration, the Lord uses a tree and its fruit. Now, if you've ever been or you've ever had an opportunity to go to an orchard, pay close attention to the fruit trees. Now, if the orchard owners haven't done anything about it, you may run into an old bug infested tree with its limbs barely hanging on and its leaves dried and withered. When you see such a tree, let me ask you, what kind of fruit do you expect to see from those trees? Now, then take a look at the strong trees, limbs rising to the sky, loaded with beautiful green leaves and no bugs in sight. Now, what kind of fruit would you look for in those trees? Now, let's say you had a spiritual mirror in front of you. What kind of fruit do you expect from what you see staring back at you? Or maybe I should first ask, do you even have a spiritual mirror to look at yourself with? Well, if you're not sure what I'm talking about here, if you're not sure what the spiritual mirror is, the spiritual mirror I'm referring to is God's word. So, if you were staring at the spiritual mirror, does God's word reflect at you the kind of person you are and, and the kind of fruit you're bearing? Because you see, according to verse 44, you must fit in some category, fig tree or thorn bush, grapevine or bramble bush. You are either producing fruit or just an unfruitful weed in the ground. The thing is, a tree bears fruit, good or bad, depending on what it is in itself. In his commentary, Adam Clark wrote this, not to have good fruit is to have evil. There can be no innocent sterility in the invisible tree of the heart. He that brings forth fruit and that he, he that brings forth no fruit and he that brings forth bad fruit are both only fit for the fire. So listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, the best way to know what category you're in is to study, is by studying God's word diligently. Here, in God's Word, in these pages, you'll see, it'll show you, you'll, you'll get the real picture of, of the real you. Now, in verse 45, Jesus tells us that our hearts function like a storage place. Now, some translations will use the word treasure. And imagine again like a treasure chest, a treasury, where both good and evil are stored. If there is good stored in the heart, it will reveal itself, it will show. If there is evil stored in there, that too will also be known. Now some of you may be asking, how am I supposed to know? I can't look into my heart, I, I don't have... I, I don't know what's in my heart. How do I know what's stored in, in there? Well, he answers this question at the end of that verse. Now, here's how the New Living Translation puts the words of Jesus. What you say flows from what's in your heart. So, if you truly want to know what your heart is filled with, listen to yourself. Pay attention to how you speak when you're talking to people, when you're talking to your friends, when you're talking to your neighbors, not just to other Christians, but to other people, or when you're talking about other people. 
guys, do you have the mouth of a drunken sailor? Ladies, do you wor- are your words crude, mean, and hurtful? Christians, do you speak like the world does? Or do you talk like someone who has the spirit of the living God in them? Our words, what we say, what comes out of our mouths, say more about us than we think and reveal that some are good and some are evil. A man who apologized for swearing uh, by saying, it really wasn't me, heard a friend say, it had to be in you or it couldn't have come out of you. God has a spiritual rule. You are where your heart is. I've heard the other saying, you are what you eat, you are what you wear, you are. But God's rule is, you are what your heart is. An evil heart produces evil results. A good heart produces good results. So again, if you want Uh, If you want to know what the heart is producing, listen to your daily conversations. And if you just can't do that, record yourself next time you're having a conversation. Take your phone or, you know, I have my watch or whatever. Um, Record yourself. Record the conversations. I, you know, I, uh, the other night I was having the, uh, it was cold. I was having a conversation with somebody I didn't know. You know, when you text, I was texting my wife and there's a button you can press that records audio and I accidentally pressed it. And I sent it, and, and uh, I'm thinking to myself, hopefully I said, I didn't say anything bad, but yeah, no, sure enough, I, you know, I heard it later on, and I was just talking about work stuff, but, um, you know, pay attention to what you're saying. Say, pay attention, uh, are you getting involved in those conversations that you shouldn't be getting involved in? Are you saying things that you wouldn't even want your kid, a child, to be saying. In Galatians 5.20, Paul tells us what some of this bad fruit looks like. Hatred, strife, jealousy, and outbursts of anger. However, in verse 22, he tells us what good fruit looks like. Joy, I mean love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. Are these the words that are coming out of your heart? Is it the bad stuff or is it the good stuff? And look, I know it's difficult. I know that the challenge is if, if every, other, other, uh, every other word out of your mouth is an F-bomb. I understand that was my kind of language at one time. It was every other word I said was just something bad an F-bomb or some kind of curse word. And, but even now, I know that it's, it's, it's hard, it's difficult, it's challenging. I work with a bunch of guys. M- the majority of them are, are guys, and they're, if you've ever heard of locker room talk, that's constantly going on. And it is, it's challenging when um, I'm kind of put in a position where I'm having lunch with a bunch of them or when I'm just in a, in a group where I'm kind of find myself in a group with them and, and it is challenging not to get caught up in the crude jokes and the horrible conversations and believe me, I, I have, there is a lot of crude jokes in my memory banks that I can easily make people laugh with and, and I can involve myself in those horrible conversations that they talk about, I won't get into it, but there are some pretty, if, you, if you're a guy, you guys probably have an idea what I'm talking about. Um, and, and also I know that it's hard not to want to cuss out the person who just cut me off on the freeway, is, or maybe tailgating me, or worse one is when they're going too slow on the freeway. I just, I just, I, I, my, blood just begins to boil when those when that happens but here's the thing 
every time I want to, every time I want to say something, every time I want to just blurt out just that, that out, of, out of anger and frustration and, or say something that isn't right, I remember this verse. And I'm reminded that there is still evil in my heart that needs to be purged. I'm reminded I'm not perfect. I'm reminded that there's still things in there that need to be removed. There's still evil in there. Now, in those moments, again, I find myself being so thankful that I have a Savior who was willing to die to remove the evil that's still hidden in my heart. I'm like, I feel that rage, that anger, and those words begin to regurgitate, or, you know, and, uh, and I'm like, oh, Lord, thank you that you've, you died for me. Thank you that you've died for the evil, that, to remove the evil that's, that's in me. And it just changes everything. It changes my complete pers- perspective. Although that conviction stings, the conviction that there's still evil inside my heart, God's spirit then reminds me that my heart can only change when it's completely surrendered to him. And as a result, it's become a lot easier not to participate in the jokes that occur at work and just to ignore the bad drivers, to ignore, you know, if you want to tailgate me, that's fine. There's other lanes. You know, if you want to cut me off, hey, there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about their behavior actions. I, the only thing I can do is about how I react to them. And, and I mean, in, in, you all know what I'm talking about. It, it, I, I don't react like I once used to. You know. But see, here's the thing. Honestly, there'd be no way I'd know this if the Holy Spirit weren't living in me. And if he's living in you, he can and will do the same in you. He can and will do the same for you. If you have, again, this mouth, this potty mouth, he can help you. He can transform your speech. It's just a matter of surrendering your heart to him and being conscious, conscious of what comes out of your mouth. Instead of using this word, how can, you know, can you use another word? The Lord said in Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. So Christian... Fellow believer, if you want to produce good fruit in your lives, study his word diligently and allow his spirit to fill the storerooms of your hearts with his goodness. You see, the more he fills you, the more he fills the storerooms of your heart with his goodness, the more he'll enable you to live a consistent life of fruitfulness that'll be evident by the things you say and the things you do. Henry Wingblade used to say that Christian personality is hidden deep inside us. It's unseen. Like the soup carried in a a bowl high over a waiter's head. No one knows what's inside unless the waiter is bumped and he trips. Just so people don't know what's inside us until we've been bumped. But if Christ is living in us, what spills out is the fruit 
of the Spirit. Well, now that he's explained that the character of a person is determined by what their heart is filled with, Jesus will now use one more illustration to summarize this entire sermon in the next section that we're about to read. So please, if you have your Bibles open, um, let's go back there and follow along as we pick up in verse 46 and read the last four verses of this chapter. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Again, Jesus said this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? That's that's beautiful. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my word, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed and the destruction of that house was great. If you know anything about horses, I, I, I read this. Arabian horses go through rigorous training in the deserts of the Middle East. The trainers require absolute obedience from the, from the horses and test them to see if they are completely trained. The final test is almost beyond the, is, is, is almost beyond the endurance of any living thing. The trainers force the horses to do without water for many days. Then he turns them loose, and of course, they start running toward the water. But just as they get to the edge, ready to plunge in for the drink, the trainer blows the whistle. The horses who have been completely trained and who have learned perfect obedience stop. They turn around and come prancing, pacing back to the trainer. trainer. They stand there quivering, wanting water, but they wait in perfect obedience. When the trainer is sure that he has their obedience, he gives them a signal to go back to drink. Now, yes, this may be severe, but when you are on the trackless desert of Arabia and your life is entrusted to a horse, you had better have a trained, obedient horse. We must accept God's training and obey him. Well, again, here in this last section, Jesus concludes this sermon by explaining to his disciples that their ministry of character is dependent on their obedience to him. So in these verses, Jesus gives three important reasons to obey him. The first reason to obey him is that it proves whether we're followers. By saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Jesus is making a distinction between those who simply make a verbal profession of faith, those who just say, yes, I'm a Christian, and those who actually hear his sayings and does them. The word Lord, it means master. It means he has complete authority over our lives. We belong to him. And that we're obligated to do whatever he says. See, if you're going to call him Lord and then not obey him, that's a complete contradiction. It doesn't, it doesn't match. Now, this warning here applies to people who speak or say things to Jesus or about Jesus, but in all reality, they don't mean it. Or they just say them superficially. Sure, they may believe in the value, 
They may believe, they may see the importance and the beauty of Jesus' words. Or they may even use them to make a religious argument or to justify their behavior or just to, to say something beautiful in a speech. But sadly, their minds are elsewhere and speak with no heart, no soul, and without the Holy Spirit. This warning of Jesus also applies to people who say, Lord, Lord, and yet their spiritual life doesn't reflect their daily life. Although they may go to church on Sundays, although they may go to church on Wednesdays, Saturdays, they go to Bible studies, they go to the women's studies, go to conferences and all that, the rest of the week, they just continue in their sin. They continue to do things they're not supposed to do just like every other unbeliever. But here's what they don't understand. When someone says, Jesus is my Lord, every time you say, Jesus is my Lord, what they're saying, what you're saying is that you're a true follower, that you're truly following him, that you truly love him, and that you are completely loyal to him. You see, faith and love, and you can apply this also to marriage, that here we're talking about, again, uh, our relationship with the Lord. But faith and love involve obedience. But if we don't really love him, if we don't, if we're not really in love with God, with our Savior, and we don't really believe on him, we're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time doing what he says. Are you... A lot of people, they tell me what to do. And a lot of times, I don't do it with my wife because I love her and I care for her. When she tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. Well, 99% of the time. <laughs> but this, uh, again, this, sh this should apply to, to the Lord. If you're really in love with him and he tells you to do something, if it says, if he speaks to you specifically about something that he says in his word, if you're really in love with him, you're going to do it. The more you know him, the more of a, uh, close, the closer you are to him, the more you're going to be like, yes, Lord. This is how I want to live my life. This, you, you know what's good for me, you know what's right for me, and I'm going to obey you. Our Lord's emphasis here is on obedience. But see, obedience is more than just hearing his word and calling him Lord. We must also obey what he commands us to do. But how does one begin to do this? How can a person obey and call someone Lord who they do not know? Well, it's going to require these steps of faith. First of all, you must surrender and submit. Unfortunately, though, because of our sinful nature, our minds, our hearts are inclined to reject and rebel against the creator, the creator of this universe. But the moment a person truly recognizes who they're truly going up against, once they realize, hey, wait a minute, this is the Lord God Almighty. This is the creator of heaven and earth, everything that is above, underneath, the Alpha and the Omega, once they truly understand that it's pointless to, to fight against God, 
they have no choice but to humbly surrender and submit. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2, says this, This is the Lord's declaration. I look favorably on this kind of person, one who is humble, submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. Do you tremble at his word? It's a great question. Now, once a person has surrendered and submitted, the next step is to believe and trust. Believe and trust are not mutually exclusive principles in the Christian faith. Rather, sides on the same coin. You see, if you truly believe in Jesus, you will trust him. And if you trust him, it means that you believe in him. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, I tell you, anyone, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. If you're going to surrender your life to God, know this. You can trust and you can believe that he'll protect you and watch over you every moment, every second of your life. Why? Why can you have so much trust in him and, and believe in him? Because it says in Numbers 23, 19, God is not man that he might lie, or a son of man that he might change his mind. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, it says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He can't lie. He can't go on his promises to to unsave you. Now you can act and walk in, in, in disobedience, but he still loves you, he still cares for you, and he will still be there to hold you, to embrace you, to bring you back when you're ready to come back. But he will protect you. He, you can believe. That's why we, we can believe and trust in him. Because he does not go back in his word. He will not lie. So after taking those steps of surrendering and submitting, believing and trusting, the third step of faith a person must take is to reconcile and obey. The moment you place your faith in God, the moment you surrender your life, your heart to God, Reconciliation begins to take place. You see, because of sin, enmity existed between us and God. There's a huge gap there. There's a huge pit. There's a huge hole. Maybe you guys have seen that, and gals have seen that illustration of there's man and there's God and there's a big hole in there. But when Jesus died on the cross, his blood cleansed us of all sin and he filled that gap so that now we have access to him. So now we can, he can have access to us and we can have access to him and we can have this, there's this, this harmonious relationship. And every time I think of it, man, I get chills because I, again, I think about the kind of person I, I, I am, the, my sinful nature, the things that I've done. And, and there's no, I used to think there's no way God would accept me. There's no way God would love me. But because of Jesus, because his death, because he, the blood that was shed on the cross, there is that reconciliation now. There is that, he bridged that gap that once existed between man and God. 
So not only was our relationship restored to God, but as Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, we have been justified by faith. We now have peace through our Lord Jesus peace not at war with him we have peace now with God reconciliation therefore will naturally when you reconcile with someone it will naturally lead to obedience our Savior said this in, chap- in John chapter 14 verse 21 the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and reveal myself to him. Thus, obedience to Jesus as Lord is not just an option for some who want to be more committed It's a vital aspect of the entire Christian life. It's everything we are. It's everything you want to do. It's just to obey him because of what he did, because of the bridge that was, because of the cross. Now, you just want to obey what he says. It ought to make you want to obey what he says. He loved you so much that he died to give you so that you can have that relationship with the Lord, with God. So the point is this. You'll obey who you love. And as hard as it is sometimes, your love will lead you to obey. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, love is just not a, is not just a sentiment Love is great controlling passion and it always expresses itself in terms of obedience. So if Jesus Christ is to be the Lord of your life, it'll be known by your willingness to surrender and submit to him. Believe and trust in him. Reconcile with him and obey him. Now the second reason we ought to obey Jesus is because our obedience will withstand the test of time and eternity. Here Jesus described the one who only hears, but acts, and who not only hears, but acts upon Jesus' words. The someone refers to those who come to Christ for salvation, hears his words for instruction, and acts on them by obeying him. He is a, he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And who is that rock? It's Jesus. You lay that foundation on Jesus. Now, a good engineer will tell you that anchoring a foundation to bedrock so that a house rests on a solid foundation is essential for sound building. Yes, it can be time-consuming, and it can be difficult, and it can be hard, and it can be expensive. And because of that, it's often avoided. But when that happens, or when you invest in that, when you build on that solid foundation, when the storms hit and the flood waters crash against that house, it'll stand firm because it's well-built making the time, the cost, and the toil completely worth it. Thus, a house built and a foundation obedient to Jesus will withstand the test of time and eternity. Now, the parallel of this parable in the spiritual life is clear. The house represents our lives that we're currently building. The question is, Are you building your lives on the sure foundation of obedience to Jesus, or are you building it on the sand of empty profession? 
See, you can spend loads of money making the house look great, but if the house isn't resting on solid ground, it's going to be a waste of money. But if you're building on a house, the house of your life, on the bedrock of Jesus, your house holds more value than any multi-billion beachfront home in California. Any mansion, the White House, you can think of any beautiful structure in the world. When your house is built on the foundation of Jesus, it's more valuable, more beautiful, more eternal than anything anyone can build on earth. Proverbs 10.25 tells us why. When the storms of life come, the wicked are whirled away. But the godly have a lasting foundation. Now the flood refers to both the trials, to both the, the trials of this life. Um, yeah, it refers to the trials of this life. The person who's built their life on obedience to Jesus has a firm foundation that will carry through every vicious storm and flood that crashes against them. Whereas the person who professes to know Christ, who just simply says is a Christian, is a Christian but isn't living that way, isn't and who isn't walking in, in obedience, will collapse when those same storms hit in their life. Here's an important fact. When you build a house, you can be sure that no matter where it's built, no matter where you build that house, storms and floods will come to test your foundation. Now, what are some of those inevitable floods that will test your faith? Well, there are the trials that we all face, such as disappointments, sickness, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, being let down by friends and family. Then there are the certain floods that go along with growing older, such as diminishing health, strength, and the inevitability, in 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 sorry, that word isn't coming out, inevitability, inevitability, there we go, of, of our own death. Furthermore, there are, the death, there are the floods of temptation that come at us from the world, the flesh, and the devil when, he constantly, when they constantly press on us, such as the enticement to cheat on a school exam or to steal or to indulge in something immoral or even focus on the pleasures of riches. You see, all these trials test whether we're truly disciples of Jesus Christ or just fickle followers who aren't sincere in our faith. As a Christian, if you're not establishing a daily habit of obeying the words of Jesus, gaining control of your thoughts, your words, your actions, confessing and repenting all known sins, then here's a reality that you may not like. You're building your life on sand. When these inevitable temptations, when these trials come, they will sweep away that profession of faith that you've made. Saying that you're a Christian, it's just going to, you're not even going to say that anymore. You're just going to be in that trial, in that storm, and you're going to be finding yourself, your house will be swept away. On the other hand, when you build your house, a foundation obedient to Jesus, you can be absolutely certain that it'll withstand the test of time and eternity. The third reason to obey is because the consequences, this is important, the consequences of not obeying will be catastrophic. The foolish man is one who hears Jesus' instruction 
but does not act on his teaching and instead says, you know what, I hear what you're saying, Jesus, but I'm good. Never mind. I'm going to do my thing. That's, in all reality, disobedience. This kind of person appreciates the nuggets of wisdom from the Bible. They claim, again, that they're Christian and may even live by the nice teachings of Jesus. But because there wasn't a solid foundation, as soon again as the storms of life raged and the floods of trials crash against the house, it immediately collapses. And what does it say there? And the destruction of that house was great. Spiritually, many of you may come, or there may be some Christians, a lot of Christians, who just come for the benefits that he offers. It seems that if they're, it seems as if they're instantly enjoying the blessings of salvation, even though they've never repented of sin and aren't reading or abiding by what the Bible says. They enjoy the good feelings of singing praise songs and swaying with the music and the love that exists within a fellowship of, between a body of believers. But their private lives, in their private lives, they are not digging the foundation of obedience to God's word. And sadly, we know from experience that it's only a matter of time before the flood hits and their spiritual house will come crashing down. Now, there is one more important aspect of this passage that I want to bring up. If you're wondering what you can do to make sure your house is built on the rock of obedience, on the solid foundation to Jesus and not on sand, Jesus mentions three things in verse 47. First, you must come to Jesus. This implies a personal, one-to-one -one relationship between Jesus and you. Second, you must hear Jesus. You must hear Jesus' words. This implies growing in your knowledge and understanding of his teaching as revealed in the Bible. Third, Jesus says that we must act on his words. This implies soul-searching obedience down to our very thoughts, our motives, and our attitudes. To summarize here, a ministry of character requires a heart that is producing good fruit and a life that is built on, the solid, on a solid foundation. The former requires an indwelling of the Holy Spirit and diligently studying God's word. And the latter, will re it's also going to require the Holy Spirit, but it's also going to require an intentional effort on our part to do what he says. As much as we may not like it to, to, to obey what God's word says, if you truly want to be transformed into the image of Christ, if you do want to become more like Christ and you want to have an effective ministry of character, you must come to Jesus, hear his words, and practice it, practice them in your daily life. When you begin, when the more you do this, when you begin to do this and the more you do this, you'll have a foundation that will last until eternity, last into eternity. Now, in a minute, we're going to partake in communion together as, as a church. But if there's anyone here, anyone watching or, or listening that wants to have that relationship, that wants to draw near to the Lord that wants to be born again, or maybe you did have that close relationship, but you walked away and now you want to return to him. You see your need for him. 
maybe you're facing some of these trials. The storms are beginning to hit your house and you need Jesus. You need that to, to build your house on that solid foundation. Well, I want to invite you to come to him personally. And afterwards, for those of you that are here, we will be able to part, you'll be able to participate with us in communion. But if that's you, I want you to, wherever you're at, close your eyes and bow your head and pray this. Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've blown it. I'm not perfect. I believe Jesus came to die on the cross for my sins, to forgive me of my sins. I confess that He is Lord. And so now I lay my sins before, all my sins before Him and so that you may wash me clean. I accept your forgiveness. And believe that I'm your child. Now fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. So I may walk with you. So I may fall in love with you. So I may see the world through your eyes. Change me. Change the way I speak, the way I think, Lord. I know that you will. I trust you. I believe in you. Thank you for making me your child. In Jesus' name, amen.